Thank you for listening to this podcast from TRE. Talk Radio Europe, your voice in Spain and around the world. For more information, please visit tre.radio. Discuss, challenge, inform, comment, viewpoint on Talk Radio Europe. Giles Brown. Live comment and discussion with studio guests. Viewpoint. It is Tuesday the 30th of January. You listen to Viewpoint Talk Radio Europe's current affairs programme, phone and show with guests. We're discussing the issues of the day. So today we're going to be talking about Georgia versus war, war and the developments of the past couple of days, including uh, the fatal drone strike on an American base in Jordan and the events obviously in Gaza and Ukraine. Is the world a safer place? We have had uh, calls for a a citizen's army being re-established in the UK and also calls for bringing back conscription. like to hear your thoughts on that. Also, uh, developments uh, with uh, strikes in France, more strikes in the UK as the government lurches uh, towards, uh, seemingly towards a general election in November. If you want to get involved with today's show, then these are the numbers. To contact TRE, please call 952-78-4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at tre Talk Radio. Yes, indeed. Let's have a look at today's front pages, though, this morning. Looking at uh, the front pages, most of Tuesday's newspapers in the UK have images of the King and Catherine, the Princess of Wales, who've left the central London hospital where they were both being treated. Royals on the road to recovery. It declares the Metro as it leads on the King and Princess of Wales being discharged from the private London clinic uh, after surgery. Uh, The Daily Mail reports the Princess of Wales uh, has reunited with her children for the first time in two weeks because they were not taken to visit her in hospital. Uh, it says she's not expected to do any official engagements till after Easter. A picture of health is the accompanying caption on an image of the King on the front of the Daily Telegraph. The paper says King Charles waved to crowds saying he's grateful for everyone's kind wishes as his deported, departed London clinic accompanied by the Queen. Daily Express has a similar image of King Charles with the paper's message to the royals wishing you both well. Tabloid reports that the king could be off work for a month following his three-night stay in the Marabone Hospital. In other domestic news, dismay as households face two billion pound council tax increase is the Guardian's lead. It reports officials in the levelling up department have told council bosses in England they expect bill payers to get the maximum possible rise from of almost 5% from April. A government spokesperson said councils are responsible for their own finances but they should be mindful of the cost of cost of living pressures. The Times has learnt uh, Iranian dissidents living in the UK have been warned by counter-terrorism police in the past fortnight of an increased risk of violence and kidnap. Potential targets have told, been told that Tehran is using proxies such as gangs to carry out assassination attempts, make death threats and engage in other types of intimidation. England and Manchester United striker Marcus Rashford is pictured on the front of the sun as the tabloid claims the 26-year-old was out drinking in Belfast until the early hours last week. The 26-year-old uh, called in sick. Manchester United says Rashford has taken responsibility for his actions and uh, report after reports he was seen in night spots in Northern Ireland on Wednesday and Thursday evening. And finally, the Financial Times claims Flutter, the gambling group which owns Paddy Power, is planning to quit the UK's FTSE 100 index by moving its primary listing to New York, describing what dealing what it calls uh, an, another blow to London's ailing equity market. Let's have a look at those front pages then from the top guardian dismay as cal- households face two billion pound council tax increase the metro royals on road to recovery the daily telegraph farmers lay siege to paris with vow to cut off food and also biden draws up plans for iran revenge strikes the times dissidents in britain warned of iran threat uh, the sun Rashford's 12-hour tequila party before calling in sick. 
He passed out at 3 a.m. Um, the I, Cameron, to warn that UK facing biggest threat since Cold War. This is Foreign Secretary Lord David Cameron uh, planning to make his first major speech since rejoining the government in the coming weeks. Papers is expected to say the world is now more dangerous than any time since the Cold War as he pushes the UK to strengthen its defence against hostile actors, it says here. Daily Express, new fast-track NHS test will save lives. Uh, this is... Um, uh, this is, uh, say, well, this is, this is the, the main story. Millions of lives could be saved. The Daily Mail, Rishi goes to war over rail strikes. PM attacks the union's campaign of contempt for passengers. Uh, the Financial Times, um, flutter lines up New York listing in fresh blow to London equity market and uh, a photograph, deadly dra- Dudley drones. Iran not looking for, ir- uh, sorry, US not looking for Iran war. And finally, the Daily Star. Daily Star claims a beluga whale who went AWOL from Vladimir Putin's army has found a new forever home. The tabloid says the whale was found by a Norwegian fisherman with a harness around it and a sign attached which read, Equipment St. Petersburg. Uh, locals believed it had been sty- spying for Russia. Secret agent beluga, that's a whale, who ditched mad Vlad finds his forever home with 600 pals. The spy who came in from the cold. And those for better or worse are your headlines. Uh, this Tuesday, the 30th of January. All- Viewpoint with Giles Brown. Always live, always lively. So I'm getting ahead of myself there. Right then, I'm joining the studio this morning by Alf. Good morning, Alf. Well, good morning, Giles. And I've decided, as, as I've go. got a run of the place, so I'm moving to the extreme left. Yes, you are. <laughs> Even more so. Any, any further, and you'll be joining <laughs> the flat as, as, you, as you topple off the edge. Any further, and I'll be joining Milliam. Oh, blimey, there's a thought. Anyway, uh, well, how are you, how are you on this on this merry Tuesday? It's cold. Cold wind today. Arr. Horrible. I don't like the cold. I, I didn't come to Spain for the cold. It's not the Brexit you've had. It's not the Brexit we've had no, before. But I blame you all on Brexit. Yeah, course. absolutely. The weather. Brassic Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> right then. Look, let's, uh, if you want to get involved with today's show, 952-78-4000, looking at some of the, well, looking at some of the, uh, over the past three days, because over the weekend, three US soldiers uh, were killed in a drone strike in what had been a pretty secret base in, in Jordan. It seems that they're in a, a, a drone had got in as a US drone was was coming in, um, and this drone is being sent by what has been widely regarded as a, a proxy group from uh, supported by Iran. Iran has obviously been getting quote unquote some bad press recently with their backing as well, seemingly of the of the Houthi rebels who have been disrupting shipping in the Red Sea. And we had this situation quite quite incredible scenes last week with um you know the head of the army saying that we were had to prepare for a war with Russia now. Oh, nine five two seventy eight four thousand. Would like to hear from you on this one because oh, do you think I will? I will unleash that hoary old beast, which is national conscription coming back again. But with with the with the prom, Prime Minister Boris Johnson also going on his social medias last week to saying that he would join up. Uh, indeed, that that would strike the fear of God into lots of people. But um, are we? Do you think we're living in a more dangerous time than we've been for a long time, Alf? I I think the. It, it, of course it's more threatening but nobody's certain how far the threats will go it's, it's extremely difficult I mean in my lifetime I mean the closest we got is my dad was called up for Korea yeah okay so he was he was in the army did his national service came out of that and then and then did two weeks sleeping in the Brecon Beacons on straw palliasses. That was his training for Korea. I'm not sure he would have survived the ice and snow in Korea, but then I can I can remember I was very young, but I can remember my dad saying to me afterwards, that was the most scariest time of his life being called up for national service because it looked like you know, going back into war. And I, and I look at the kids of today, none of whom have, have seen, you know, there's a lot of conflict out there. There's a lot of people who go through the armed services. But I don't think the youngsters of today feel as threatened as they should be because th- there is a danger of this. And, and one of the things that should be stark to everybody, we have two of the, two of the biggest aircraft carriers in the world sitting in Plymouth or Portsmouth, one of the two, 
doing nothing because they haven't got enough people mm. to man them. Now, a, an aircraft carrier, as I understand it, needs somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred staff just to get it to sea. That's without the people doing any of the action or, or all the all the nasty stuff that goes on. This is just someone who can turn turn the key and the motor starts and off it sails out into the the, the jolly sea. Also, what's happening is, I mean, Johnson never helps with these situations, but we have a, a major general, or whoever he is, comes on and says, we've got to review the position on, you know, we could be facing conscription, we could be facing armed efforts with, with Russia. And then you get dopey Johnson coming on, pretending it's Benny Hill-like, doing silly salutes and things, and, and just belittling the whole... And he, it's like, do you not understand, Johnson, how dangerous this is almost going back to uh, the, the pandemic and and the way johnson treated oh he was near death well yeah but he wasn't on a ventilator so he wasn't that near to death mm. he, he was in hospital that's for true but he, he was the prime minister so of course you're going to look after him so I, I just find it extremely strange how people are treating this a little bit more blasé than perhaps they should be. And the bigger threat, I think I said it uh, last week to the guys in the studio, is Iran. Is, and they came on yesterday and made the same statement that lots of them have made before. We do not control these these groups of people who are their own people. We do not tell them what to do. We we don't guide them. We don't tell them to send drones. We don't tell the Houthi what to do. We're not telling Hamas. It's called no. You, you don't directly, but indirectly, it's all part of the same philosophy. And the, the simple fact that you give somebody dangerous arms. That, that can kill hundreds of thousands of people means that you are complicit in what's going on. So we shouldn't we shouldn't run away from this Iran thing. And and anybody who rings in and wants to talk about Trump and Trump being the next president, just remember one hell of a lot of this Iranian stuff started when Trump took the lease off over the nuclear pact with Iran. Because Iran were, you know, were not, not controlled, but there was a bigger understanding of what Iran's capability was, nuclear capability was, would be, you know, before Trump, when Obama was dealing with them and things like that. And then he, he says, oh, I'm going to do And there hasn't been a war. Of course there wasn't a war. They didn't need to have a war. They weren't prepared to have a war. But he's given them the, the 20 years they needed in order to rearm, rechange, you know, revitalise all all these terrorist groups that pop up all around the place creating this havoc and, and the, the, the thing that I don't know how you describe us I'm not a Christian right I'm not a Muslim I'm a non-religious I'm an atheist but having said that I, I, I really really struggle with how how do you deal with nutcases my term not their term. How do you deal with these people who are religious zealots, I think is the proper word, who just, they're just fixated on their religion and they say, this this goes back to the uh, to the Saracens and, <laughs> and all of that that went on. It's n nothing has ever changed. And people sit down and they go, oh yeah, we're going to have a you know, two-state settlement, we're going to have this and we're going to have that. It's called, you, if if the Arab population never change their opinion about wanting to wipe out Israel and, and Jews, right. it will never change. Never change. You might end up with a, a period of peace. You may end up with a period where people aren't being, you know, murdered by the by the thousands, but it still doesn't change the, the philosophy of the world where it's Pure hatred facing pure hatred. Nine five two seven eight four thousand. The WhatsApps plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. This in from Sheila saying, "Why don't they bring back conscription? Might do some of these youngsters some good." We've had that one. Military service course in Spain, Milly. Uh, that was going. I think until I think it was nineteen eighty six eighty seven for uh, young people to be conscripted in Switzerland. Of course, it is. I heard Stephen going. I think it was the other day uh, in Switzerland. In certain parts of, I think. Uh, give me a call and let me know nine five two seventy eight four thousand. I think it's 
uh, spine. 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 Spine's conscription, but also uh, the Dutch, I think, still have conscription, or the Danes. But the Spanish system was quite clear, wasn't it? You you had to do, you had to join the armed services of however however long it was, and if you didn't, you did the Red Cross. You opt out. You worked for the Red Crescent or Red Cross or one of, or or you became an armed guard in a supermarket or a shop or in my case I remember coming to a, a camp a, a, you know, a camping holiday camping site yeah and, and they had we, we used to call them the El Shushos because you know, what the El Shushos the El Shushos because you know 20, 20 odd year old young blokes wandering around the campsite with guns and and truncheons that we'd never seen not in my era you know. and, and there's us on a family uh, camping holiday and, and at 10 o'clock they say right you've got to turn your radios down you've got to do yeah. stuff. I understand that but then these guys would walk around the camp and, and everybody knows put on a put a uniform on somebody and they turn into a different animal so they used to walk around the campsite and they'd go past these tents going shh yeah. shh keep the noise shh they never said keep the noise they just said something in Spanish which meant keep the noise down so we ended up they were called the El Shushos I like that that's, that's quite a good one El Shushos right okay um, looking at some of the but um, yes I mean Spain had the military service until until that oh, period of time what would that be that would be 18, I, mean, I remember because I was, I was 90s the, yeah, I was I was living here, and a lot of my friends when I was in, I was seventeen in eighty five. I was seventeen. A lot of my friends in the following years went into to do their service in the Millie, and yeah, it was twelve. I think it was twelve months or eighteen months if you did the Cruz Roja. So it would it would absolutely frighten the death out of a, an eighty year old woman walking into John Lewis's to be met by a guard with a gun. Absolutely right. Yeah, so. and that's what you and that's what you see. Well, there's uh, tell a lie. Most of the most of the guards these days in the shops yeah, all... are not carrying guns yeah. but they do have batons and they do have uh, tasers in some of the places right then so um, looking, looking at some of the bits and pieces coming in on the whatsapps plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five uh this in ray good morning to you the two air the two uk aircraft carriers are currently docked in portsmouth simply because to go to sea they need a fleet auxiliary ship to supply them whilst at sea but sea but the uk n- now only has one fleet auxiliary and that ship's had to go into dry dock for repairs. Um, meanwhile, some more bits and pieces. Um, same with the Israeli zealots and Western weapons supply to Israel. This is just. Can you, if you can, if you can expand on those uh, on those uh, comments, please. Uh, also, all this posturing is just a distraction from the something show which is the UK today remember Thatcher and the Falklands we are about to be subjected to even more empty shells with Brexit checks on UK produce coming in uh, tomorrow and people can't even afford mortgages but oh no look over there have a war um, meanwhile conscription was abolished in Spain in 2001 thank you very much 2021 no 2001 excuse me um, <laughs> so they're going to say I knew it was still around but we, go back to the ship whatever the reason well, you know, I, I don't understand all that technical stuff I just know there's two aircraft carriers sitting in port that can't go out, can't do anything because we don't have enough. We don't have enough. Whether it's enough ships, whether it's enough, you know, even if we had the ships, I doubt if we've got enough sailors. Yeah, because because we, over the years, I, sp- I suppose you have to look at it. And like, I remember what was it was about 15 years ago when they started on about the uh, the, the cyber stuff. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? And it's called, where do you put your money? Do you put it into cyber well, technology or do you put it into a, a destroyer? And here's the thing, because we were always being told, we were being told 10 years ago, five years ago, by by various politicians that, you know, the future war is going to be a cyber war. And it must be very sexy for a politician to think think that and go, yeah, because we're going to be leading the, the fight against cyber security. Cause it, and, and of course, if you, if you know, if you, if you know your history, it's, it's full of small regional conflicts breaking out. It's, it is sort of British infrastructure. On the you know in on the in the in the Kyber push or whatever uh, on the far flung outposts of empire and so we're not seeing these great nuclear because the Telegraph had a had a thing yesterday about a column in its editorial about how how Britain would survive World War Three you know and go to Waitrose and stock up if he can without these food regulations and we assume that he, well forget it unless you've got a bunker you're not going to survive World War Three but people are actually, even, even if you've got a bunker you wouldn't survive but Eve but people are literally talking about now the possibility yeah. of nuclear powers. Yeah. 
both of them knowing that they're not going to push the button because nobody's that, that bananas, but having small scale, if such a thing exists, conflicts, with Sweden saying we've got to be ready to fight the Russians, with the Finns going here we go again, it's 1940 whatever, the, Swin- the Finnish uh, Soviet war, of course. And, and just, even, if, and, even if it isn't nuclear weapons, it's, it's just. You just say nuclear, and you yeah. and, and you have these visions. What happened? You know, we had it in Japan when the tsunami hit the nuclear power station, and what could have happened. We have it in Ukraine today. Yeah. By accident, by accident, somebody could fire a missile into Chernobyl, or whatever that whacking great big yeah, nuclear Chernobyl, power yeah. station is. Well, we you know, it's got two names now, hasn't it? But whatever it is, they fire a missile by accident. You know, it's always going to be by accident. You know, Russia fires a, a massive, great, big ballistic missile. The Ukrainians fire something to shoot it down, and by accident, it ends up in a nuclear power station. And you've got it, it, visions of Holocaust. You know, it's like what thousands of people wiped out by accident, and and then. Yeah, and that's without saying that well, we're going to have a nuclear war. What was it yesterday? Last night? Uh, North Korea? Just uh, saying, yeah. It's both. Fired three. Just to say, oh, we're here, by the way. We yeah, don't yeah. forget about us. Oh, yeah, just, yeah, but they weren't just missiles. They, they had a whacking great big Exocet missiles, weren't they? I think they're Exocets. Yeah. But whatever they are, are so they'll be ballistic, they'll be intercontinental. Well, I don't think they'll be intercontinental ballistic missiles, but they'll be. No, they'll be no, they, they were. They were cruise missiles they fired three cruise missiles and you go well a cruise missile will be you can fire a cruise missile and it will go up in the air and it'll come down in the mountains and it'll make a little bang and that's about it now stick a nuclear warhead on the end of it and, and you have got something to you know consider about so going back to the original what you originally said yeah and the fear factor i can honestly say i'm 70 odd years of age now um and I can't remember, even even when Cuba was going on, even through that, now there's a feeling of, oh dear, what's going to happen next? What accident is going to happen next that's going to create a major, major conflict? Well, not only that, we've got, we've got China and Taiwan as well, which has been rumbling on in the background. I mean... Yeah, but uh, you know, are people outside of, of that sphere, uh, other, than, other than the United States, you know, all the Western world are going to say we support Taiwan because of this, that and the other... In, in reality, the, these are the sort of places. It's like a Hong Kong, isn't it? Taiwan. It's going to be. You did it. You, you know, Taiwan has never left China. Yeah, you know, this is. Well, it's, it's only the people who lived Kai there. Shek, wasn't it? And you're taking his, you know, taking yeah, his took, it, took, the, took his moderate right wing, whatever they were, Chinese off. Not off. not Chairman Mao, basically. Absolutely. Well, it, was, it wasn't even him, was it? It was just if you wasn't a peasant and you had a few quid, you could get on a boat and go to Taiwan and survive. No, it's, this is reality of life. You know, the, the Chinese communists relied on you know people working in paddy fields or in you know nothing who who would do as they were told because they were promised a better life for the people in taiwan they wasn't promised a better life they were promised that, you know, you give up some of your life to make these other people have a better life yeah. so they fled to taiwan so I can only see that you know. There will, I don't think there will ever be a war, war, but there will be some sort of negotiated settlement. But we, yeah, but we have seen. We have seen. The problem is, we've seen that war. You know, serious wars break out from small conflicts and from misunderstandings. And and when you've got. I mean, rogue nations seems to be... It's like when people say lone wolf. It seems to be one of those, those sort of hackney tabloid sort yeah. of mendels. But I, got, I always smile about the Falklands. Um, f- for my sins, I was a, a union, a, an elected national executive member, and I had responsibility for looking after the uh, British Telecom ships. And what people don't understand and what they probably don't know or remember is that yeah. three, of the, three of the British telecom ships were part of the fleet that went to the Falklands because the British Navy never had. They never had a flat, a flat back uh, uh, barge to land helicopters on. Right. They, and they couldn't land it on their ships because the ships weren't capable, not all the ships. They also sent out things like, you, know, you send a cable ship out, a cable ship goes from, from the deck 
to the to the the bottom of the boat, you know, whatever they call yeah. the, the bottom, the keel, keel perhaps, yeah. And, and there's like a, there's like six six foot two meters of of the bottom of the boat that's flat, and the whole of the rest of the boat is open. That yeah, they put thousands and thousands of meters of cables in these cable ships. They go out to sea for six months, yeah. laying cable, yeah. don't come in. So they send one of them to the Falklands. They put everything in it. Yeah, they, they, everything for the. So it wasn't a naval thing. No, it was just. It, well, it, it's just it's always the same. Look at the Atlantic conveyor, for example. Absolutely, which always, always hit and, and stuff then, like that. And the Canberra. What was it? They said, "Well, if we have any, if we have any uh, people get wounded or whatever, so they seconded some." Um, what did we call this ship, didn't they? Liner. Uh, yeah, yeah. They yeah. converted it into an hospital ship the, um, and things like that. There were only, I think there were only four ships, four actual naval ships that went to the Falklands. Well, no, I mean, there was... Anyway, let's, let, uh, I, 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 no, I should... Proper, should, sh- proper yeah. naval ships. There were lots of ships. Yeah. And they weren't all naval ships. Galahad, and they for, did, uh, you know, I'm thinking... Well, of course you've got your... your you know, Sheffield, etc. Yeah, go on then. Name all the others. I can't name all the others. No. I'm not a naval man. The but one I, that, I know I'm out of can. Yeah. Morning to you, Gary. <laughs> Gary, the, yeah, Gary. Don't forget the mechanical problems the UK carriers have had as well at uh, Her Majesty's Naval Base in Portsmouth. But it's an we, The thing is, we... The, the, it's 18,000... 18... I can't take calls in on the WhatsApp, guys. So I have to call me on 952 Um... We have made you eighteen thousand pounds a year is the uh, the salary at the moment for an infantry man, and so therefore, if I'm an eight, if I'm an eighteen year old, because you're not allowed to go on active service now after the Falklands, you could do because you're seventeen year olds who have yeah. tumbled down. But if I'm an eighteen year old and I'm looking at going into into an art career in the army, despite all the, the you know the fantastic advertising campaigns they have, eighteen thousand pounds a year is not a lot to, to serve king and country and and put your life on the line. So it's this. this this is the problem about making the and also to to say to people it's not like call of duty you'll spend most of your time sitting in a field covered in mud somewhere i was going to say somewhere in the in the british army of the rhine but we don't even have that anymore but you you, you see what i'm saying there so it's not but it's on, not an attraction. on top of the 18 000, you have to take put everything in context on yeah, top of the 18 000, get they get fed watered housed you know they get to see the world what, whatever that whatever field, that field i was talking about morning call you live on tre what's your name where you're calling from what's your viewpoint please Yes, good morning. Uh, morning amazing. Gary. Thank you for getting involved. Right. How are you, mate? Uh, uh, amazing. Amazing. First of all, no one's mentioned the mechanical problems yep. that the two aircraft carriers, particularly uh, one in particular in HM Naval Base Portsmouth, which is an issue and has been for a while since it's been built. Secondly, it's in the uh, Chinese constitution, their version of a constitution, that they've got to reclaim nationalist Taiwan, which is completely different from Hong Kong. Taiwan is where the national ran to in 1940, 1949 away from the communists the Kuomintang and uh, they, they, the Chinese constitution as such says that it needs to be reclaimed by obviously 2049 yeah. so that is an issue and I don't believe what I just heard about four naval ships um, there was at least four naval ships that was hit by missiles by, in the Falklands yeah. war so I don't know where the four naval ships came from but uh um, the your, world is a dangerous your, place. To- in your opinion, Gary, because you, you know of such stuff, do you think that the armed forces are being made attractive enough? Should they be made attractive enough for young people who want to join? I mean, this, this is this, a, I mean, in your opinion, because I know that you study your military history. Um, you know, it's I have, the- I, let me just stop, let yeah. me just stop you there, Giles. Yeah. At, the, at, the, at the danger of being arrogant, yeah. I have exceptional, exceptional sources in the uh, MOD and, um, uh, with regards to uh, my uh, military research studies, I have to have sources to write anything about it. But where the services at the moment, the services in the past few years, the services have clashed with uh, modern, modern, uh, modern youth. Um, the services mean discipline, they mean duty, and that's not drummed into the modern youth of today, the Gen Zs or millennials or whatever, whatever you want to call them. But uh, one thing that, that, I mean, you can blame conservatives and, and uh, Labour governments, previous Labour, Labour governments, for the rundown of the services. And if any one of the past... Oh, 25, 30 years. If you've come out or gone into ports of uh, harbour on the uh, ferries from Bilbao, is it Bilbao and Santander, or one of the two, Bilbao, um, and you see the ships there, say you've got uh, 11 ships there, 
only one would be operational. The rest are just mothballed and are actually literally empty. I'm looking at four padlocks, actually, at the moment, right. which were taken off the ships many, many years ago the, the when they mothballed. But I shouldn't yeah. really say that. One of the things, Gary, as well, is that it, 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 we don't learn from history. And the whole thing about this whole, it's going to be a high-tech cyber war. And, and if, if, if you know your history like you do, you go rubbish. It's, all, it's always going to be small-scale skirmishes that, that, you know, this whole thing. that You're going, it's always going to need boots on the ground. You're always going to need a serving army. Uh, and you're going to need, but it's going to have to be, I think it's, what, 76,000 in the entire British Army at the moment, which would just about fill Wembley Stadium, wouldn't it? Or wouldn't even get the now count. I think, I think, I think. I think you'll find that number is extremely small, smaller than that, Josh, because you're talking of rear echelon and uh, other services which wouldn't be involved. Um, and I'm laughing at the moment because the world has always been a dangerous place. The only problem is it's linking up. Um, I'm, I'm very surprised, actually, overnight. Uh, I didn't go to bed till about 5 o'clock doing some research, etc. Um, I can't really see... Obviously, you've seen the, uh, the, the trending, the news wires, etc., America are going to hit back at Iran. Now, there's a lot of pressure in the States to hit back and hit back hard by both the Republicans and, surprisingly enough, the Democrats. Um, they can't do that. They really can't do that. Iran is a different, uh, Iran is a different uh, ball game. Mm. Um, and they're backed, and obviously they're backed by, uh, they're backed by Russia. Um, and to a certain extent, China. I mean, last week, what happened in Iran, uh, when Iran fired missiles into Pakistan and Pakistan retaliated, um, uh, China intervene, intervened there because it was their interest. They're big uh, allies of Pakistan, China. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it is, it is worrisome. Um, there will be diplomats fighting in the back channels to try and get some talk and going, but, uh, I think the only person that's uh, enjoying this is Putin uh, because we'll come, and we will come to an arrangement um, uh, with regards to Ukraine. Yeah. Um, but but, but uh, the Ukraine, as, it, as I say, don't get me started off on that. We ignored that for 14 years, and that goes back to the 90s anyway. We had gentlemen, I'm a great admirer of the Russians. I must admit, I'll, I'll state that on the table uh, straight away. Um, but uh, I was reading a book the other day I was reading a book the other day by Lawrence Reese, A Warning from History. Um, I've just got it in front of me now, A Warning from History. And the first three pages, when he was talking about a certain individual, it sounded like Trump thanks. and how he came to power. Got some more calls coming in, Gary. Awfully... Always good okay, to mate, see you. All the best, sir. All right, thanks for your calls in there. Good to have you with us, Gary. 952-78-4000. Morning, Cooley, you live on TRE. What's your name? Where are you calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Yeah, hi, it's Johnny Meehan. Morning, John. Um, just on that number of ships, I hate to disagree because he's always right about everything. According to Google, there were 77 uh, naval ships that went. I'll see your 77 and I'll raise you because I've had Mark come in and good morning, bro. He says, uh, the first elements set fire, set fire, set, the first elements of the force set sail for the South Atlantic on the 5th of April, 1982. The task force was composed of a hundred ships. Um, but that's that could be. We're not talking about naval vessels. They're ships. not naval ships. Yeah. They're just ships. There was loads of shit. I no. said there. There was four. No. There was four British telecom cable ships. I can absolutely assure okay. you because I had to Alf. go to Southampton to meet them when they came back. Alf, I just counted through the alphabetical list. I counted. I might have missed one or added one. There were seventy-seven naval ships in that convoy. Right of the British Navy. And, and, and if Google's right, if Wikipedia's right, then they were 77, and they were naval ships. And some of them I recognised, like the Galahad and the Tristan and whatever that got damaged, and the cop, was it? Can, okay. The ones that got... Yeah. I never, okay, I never, pro well, yeah. I never professed to be an expert in any of this. So I was just telling you my experience yeah. was based on yeah. my uh, dealing with British Telecom and and the ships that they sent out because they were asked to. They yeah. weren't even seconded; yeah. they were asked to. And and secondly, you know, for Gary's benefit, I, I never blamed any political party. This goes back, if if you recall, after Korea, that's when you saw the first. Rundown, you know, ten, 10 years after Korea, everybody assumed that the world was going to be at peace, so we started running things down. 30 years after that, we started getting the new technology wars, so you have a choice. Do you, do you invest your money in, let's, for argument's sake, GCHQ, yeah. or do you invest your money in the Ministry of Defence? And Britain chose to invest their money in GCHQ. GCHQ effectively was a spy centre. 
But you, it says you get into the spy centre because that's where you find your that's where you find your information your from information yeah. that would hopefully stop some other conflict in the future. So one, let's get this right. I, I, I didn't profess to be some sort of <laughs> guru or or whatever on on any of that stuff, and also. The reason why I said Hong Kong, you know, let's make it clear. The British were, were at it, I don't know, it was given to the British by the Chinese and the Chinese demanded it back or Singapore or whatever, whatever it is, right. you know, and, and which is no different to Taiwan. They're claiming back what is this? No different to Spain saying we want Gibraltar back. Why do oh, people not, not understand that's, that's, that? That's not okay, how about Sueta? How about Sueta? Uh, right. I think uh, some, but, someone, but in, someone in North Africa wants Sueta back, right. I think. Hang on. Can I get a moot word in? Yep. Hello. Hong Kong was leased, I believe, from the Chinese. And the lease was due to expire two years on from when Britain actually left. And they left because one is it Kowloon or whatever the other island and that, that was had to go back earlier. Yeah, it wasn't worth having Hong Kong if you didn't have that one. So right. they get, Britain decided to give up on that. Got some more calls. Yes, yeah, sorry. Alf, yeah. Alf, I really apologise for pulling you up because you are ninety nine point nine percent right on everything, and it always surprises me that I could agree with you, but I obviously do. Thanks for the call thanks, in there. Thanks very much. Some more calls thanks, coming John. in. Morning, call you're live on Thierry. What's your name? Where are you calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Well, Alf, I really apologise. Gandia. Morning to you. So, hi there. Good morning to you. Yeah. So uh, what I'm hearing is obviously rather aged people talking about 20th century technologies. I mean, a big aircraft carrier. What a big target that is. We're in, we're in the 21st century and technology is moving quickly. Imagine swarms of drones. Some of them might carry uranium. They can be programmed to make a critical mass over a area. You can't knock out a whole swarm of drones with, with anti-cruise missile technology. The technology has moved on. The whole brain power of humans must move on. Young people don't see the point of sitting in a ship as a target when they know they could be managing drones, which are not like they were even 10 years ago, great big things with 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 stupid explosives. Right. They can they can swarm over St. Petersburg tomorrow and annihilate anybody they want if there is a, a swarm of drones. Right. Do you know, Ronald Reagan, unfortunately, he, he didn't have the technology and the power of Elon Musk. He was right. Star Wars is where it should be. Elon Musk has how many satellites under his control around the Earth? Think about it. Think about Elon Musk. I, I, I try not to in the morning. It's, it's the thing that he's putting no, chips in people. think about him stroking a white cat. Think about his missile power. Think about his access to technology. Think he's putting microchips in people's heads. Yeah. He is a, a futurist. Thank you very the much for your... Is not, uh, is not ships. It's nothing to do with the... St- the people going out and fighting on the ground. Got some more drones co- technology. You, you are so far behind the technology of the future. You are, you are all showing your age. Thank you very Thank much you. for your call there. As I pull down my analog fader. <laughs> Morning, call you live on TRE. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Yeah, Giles. I'll oh, promise. Yes. I promise. I'm not. Re- I, I promise. I promise. I'm not reading the book or uh, on the yeah, computer. Of course not. Off you go. But let me. Come on. Right. First of all, first of all, Alf. During the Second World War, the Chinese had a civil war between the right, the left-wing communists under uh, uh, Mate, Matey Boy. What's his name? Ch- Chairman Mao. Oh, yeah, Chairman Mao. Yeah, and then under his friends. Yes. Okay. 
I'm the and the Chiang Kai Shek who had the Kumin Tang, the right wing fascists. The, the the communists chased the fascists into the island of Formosa, which is now Taiwan. Correct. So that's completely different to Hong Kong. And I promise I haven't got a book or a computer or a tablet or whatever in front of me. Right. But let me just say HMS Intrepid, HMS Illustrious, HMS Invincible, Heckler, which was the hot hospital ship sent down there, uh, HMS Arden, which got hit, HMS Antelope that got hit. So you're being a little bit disingenuous ingenuous to the people as you was last week in the Royal Navy and other uh, offices, agencies um, you're being a bit disingenuous to servicemen and civilians because you remember I was in Portsmouth and I saw them off I was a young 18 year old I actually look an idiot, the jingoism got into me and when I look back now I laugh I got reminded a couple of months ago Yeah, let's get you to, let's that, get you to uh, on Gary like those, those girls on the boat but I, actually, I actually I actually I actually, I actually run down. I actually run down the recruiting office and went to join up, thinking I could get a lump of forty-two, jump on a boat, and go down and give them some. Right now, okay. with the with the with the wisdom of age, it doesn't work that way, and it shouldn't work that way. But uh, and can I just pick you up on something, Alf, from last week, which left me fuming, and it's just as well I didn't phone in. You said about the post office uh, investigation bureau and the uh, MOD, I think, and the Royal Navy police and the army police, they all have to adhere to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, and they're all police agencies. So when you come out with something, again, know your research. And again, another week, there's a lot of service when I can hear jumping up and down saying, what are you talking about? Because all I can see at the moment is those ships that were hit by Exosec missiles, yeah. which they had then, which is a whole new ball game. So anything you want to know about that, if you want a cup of coffee and be educated, you speak to me. Thanks, Gary. Bye-bye. Once again, as always, 952-78-4000. I never said I saw the ships off. Yeah. I saw the ships come back. I met the people on board the ships because they were members of my union the sailors um, which, is, which is quite rare actually um, in, mo- in most organisations the sailors would have been transport and general workers or, or one of the maritime y- unions and the, the people on board the ship the cable hands and that would have been members of my union so we, we saw them back because it was a, um, we didn't see them back when they were all the flag waving I had to go down there a week later because of the issues that, that came back from the Falklands with these people Right. so and I'll say it again, I am no expert at this. I just know what I walked into. And, Gary, I dealt with these Investigation Bureau people. I dealt with them firsthand. I didn't have somebody saying these things to me. Many of them were people from the police force who couldn't get into detective jobs or couldn't get promotion and there was a bit more money being offered and I'm not talking about BT I'm talking about when it was the general post office right. with a massive workforce the biggest transport fleet in outside of um, the, the Indian Army it's a huge organisation and these people may have had some police training they may have had some police background but that was because the organization insisted that they had them because people like me from a union were saying if you want my members to be investigated and questioned and whatever by these people who have no police powers right they have no police powers right you want them to do that then you've got to come to our union and you've got to negotiate with us what they do so mine is all about first-hand experience not about some dreamt up thing i ain't reading out of a book either gary this is my life and and last but not least the guy who come on and said about the thing i, I said quite clearly that britain faced and so has europe faced this dilemma where do we put the bulk of our resources into arm um, you can put it into cyber you can put it into drone control you can put it and by the way was it 54 drones were shot down by the ukrainians over kiev in one night so there is a tech you know, america have developed a technology for mass destruction of drones the problem is when they shoot the drone down it's still got a warhead on it and it crashes down somewhere else perhaps not the intended place, but it still does damage to, to people. And, and so, But it's called, there ain't enough money in the world. 
I'll tell you another little story. If if we had that many ships going to the Falklands, anybody, you Gary, you ring me up, you tell me, which aircraft carrier did they send the Vulcan bombers off from to bomb Port Stanley? I'll tell you where they I'll tell you the aircraft carrier. It was called Bryce Norton Runway, yeah. and they filled the planes up with from American uh, fuel tankers over the top of the... Uh, Pacific, uh, over the top of the... Um, Atlantic. Atlantic, yeah. and then flew them onto the Ascensions. And when they flew back, they were filled up again by American uh, planes, right. not by British. Right. There was no aircraft carrier. We had, you, can, we, you couldn't take off. You couldn't take off with a Vulcan bomber for an aircraft uh, carrier. Of course, you'd be, you could send. You could send an aircraft carrier there. You send, yeah, but the aircraft, an aircraft carrier. Goes so where did they? Sense. So where did they fly the ship? The, 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 where did they fly the planes from that was supposed to be there protecting the ships in the sound where they got where they got bombed by the Argentinian planes? Well, those are the, those are the Harriers coming off the off Hermes, aren't they, etc.? Well, yeah, but from miles away, yeah, you, you have don't to put your aircraft carrier. Carry, you don't put your aircraft carrier okay. in the middle of the whole so, so, but, ship. But what you're trying to do is, you, you, it's like you, you, we've got limited resources. Where are we going to spend our money? Exactly. Where are we going to spend the money? That's the, the real crunch question. I don't care about whether there was 77 ships or 107 ships. It's irrelevant, totally irrelevant. What are they going to do now in the Red Sea? How are they going to deal with the issue in the Red Sea? They've still sent ships. Yeah, because they need they need aircraft carriers Absolutely. mobile command bases. Mon McCauley, you live on TRE. What's your name? Where are you calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Oh, Mr. Brewer, if it's irrelevant, why say it? And let me just correct you on something again, right? A total figment. The Vulcan bombers, which flew to the Falklands, which was the longest airborne attack in history, was refueled by RAF planes. And I'll tell you another thing, which is very... You have to find the sources. You know when we hit the runway in Port Stanley, yeah? Vulcan bombers. Yeah. They were never hit. We never hit the runway. It was a total farce. Right. The Argentinians were still flying planes in four hours before the surrender on in, in Stanley to the, the, the armed forces okay. there. They were coming out and building craters on the runway. We so need- where you get your sources from you, and history, go on. Gary, I, I tell you where I get my sources from. I yeah, there's a, there's a place, there's a place at the end of Bryce Norton Runway that was a training college for my union. I was asleep in that college the night that the Vulcan bombers took off from Bryce Norton. When those bombers yeah. came back, we were taken into yeah. we were taken into Bryce Norton and we were given a a fairly good debriefing about what happened and they were quite clear well, you shouldn't have American, been, you shouldn't American have fuel been. planes American fuel yeah, planes rubbish. fueled them on the way in and on the way out right. and they only did rubbish. and they only had one run ok I'm going to have to I'm going to have to rubbish. go to a break I'll, 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 end that, I'll end that Alf 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 another thing is my neighbour was on it mate my neighbour was on it he right. should have told me ok I, I, gonna get that. Gary thank you as always going to a break and then back with more Viewpoint Viewpoint with Giles Brown Indeed, and we're back. If you want to get involved with today's viewpoint, these are the numbers. To contact TRE, please call 952-78-4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. Right then, to the WhatsApps we go. Plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Head scratcher, spare cash. Uh, drone and digital warfare has redefined the battlefield to a certain extent. Yes, obviously, obviously, Russia is currently pushing the biggest digital psyops campaign targeting Texas. Uh, meanwhile, no, he's not Gary. Um, th- yes. Giles, please can you stop talking about the Falklands? Yeah, we'll get off that. Uh, Mark, oh, um, Harry is through, yeah, Harry is through from aircraft carriers. Oh, this is a good show. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, um, oh God, says somebody, this has become a willy waving, has, has, has this become a willy waving competition? Uh, please God, another subject in the next hour. I'm certainly not waving my, anyway, let's not even go there. Uh, in 1982, 
Eh? Hey? No, I haven't got one. Hey, thank you so much. Anyway, in 1982... That's just so woke of you, Alf. Uh, in, <laughs> in 1982... <laughs> where is the work finder general? The work, actually, the work finder general will be with us next week. Uh, Rex is joining us in the studio. Uh, 1982, and good morning to you, the UK had very limited resources, but they managed on with some extra civilian ships. Now, though, the UK has significantly less resources due to continuing financial cutbacks that have ever ha- happened since... 1982. Right then, let's get away from the, the the Falklands thing. But it's an interesting it's an interesting point to make that you know we are we're looking at we are in dangerous times. Uh, there is serious. I mean, uh, there was there was serious talk from the, from the Swedish the Swedish one of the Swedish military uh, leaders last week saying we have to be ready because and then they were pointing at Russia saying, listen, you know, Russia could be could could invade. And I mean, that's going to send a chill through to anybody because they they've got rid of 250 250,000 Two hundred fifty thousand casualties thus far that we can we can ascertain. And, and how about the, the uh, fear, fearless Finns? You know what what they've done by standing up to Russia, joining NATO, you know, turn thumbs up from their nose up, and whatever they call it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're just some people are doing some some wonderful wonderful things. Like, let me let me just come back. Nothing to do with the Falklands, but let's come back to this. Where we spend our resources, I forget who it was. It was Danet, Danet, I think he's not whoever he was, you know, a senior ex military oh, person. Yeah, Danet. Yeah, Danet. Yeah. Sunak, um, the geezer who pretends to be the defence minister, otherwise known as Grant Shapps, you mean? Yeah, yeah Grant. I can't say his name because I'm not quite sure what name he uses yes, these yes, days. Yes, of course. My, my, my friend Grant. Yeah, <laughs> is. The, the company, they've all said the same thing that your Britain on its own can't can't do it, it can't do cyber, it can't do the drones it can't do a naval it can't do an army it can't do all the modern technology it can't do them all so amongst the world and this is where Europe comes into it and I'm not an advocate of having a European army, but there should be some understanding amongst the European countries where certain elements are taken care of by one of, like Germany, say, you know, they deal with tank technology, Britain deals with cyber technology, France deals with drone technology, so that they can invest the money into all the... But then it's about how do you... We, we are not the United States of Europe. It's not like the United States of America where they can you know, have a dictate from on top that applies to everybody. Therefore, you will do this, that and the other. Well, and, there's and bongos Europe's got to sort it out. There's bongos on Saturday, which means we will go to a break and then back with more Viewpoint. Back after the national and international news. Radio Europe. Your voice in Spain. Discuss, challenge, inform, comment, viewpoint on Talk Radio Europe. Giles Brown. Live comment and discussion with studio guests. Viewpoint. Welcome back. Second half of Viewpoint. Always live. Always lively. Joining the studio by Alf Brewer. With you until 12 o'clock when Stephen Ritson takes over with Europe Today. If you want to get involved with this morning's show, then these are the numbers. To contact TRE, please call 952 78 4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. And looking at some of your main stories this morning as well, because um, this is a uh, spirits were high as night fell on protesting farmers blockading the A1 ha- uh, highway just north of Paris. This is in Telegraph. Bar- farmers barbecued sausages on bonfires Ooh. as they sipped wine and beer. A curious contrast to the main tactic of their demonstrations, which they called Operation Starve Paris. Emmanuel Macron says he'll work hard to obtain more favourable EU measures for his country's farmers. For now, the agriculture 
structural siege of the French capital uh, continues. Meanwhile, councillors in the UK are mulling a maximum t- uh, t- tax hike. Uh, local authorities nationwide are gearing up to raise council tax by the highest possible amount this year to boost their finances, the government has signalled. Councils will see an increase in core spending power up to £4.5 billion. Pounds. Uh, Michael Gove called the t- told the Commons last week as he pledged an injection of extra £600 million pounds in government, uh, local government. Uh, uh, meanwhile, also, uh, Rishi Sunak has gone to war with rail bosses over uh, rail strikes. The paper says the PM is coming out fighting and venting his frustration by accusing union leaders of showing no interest. Uh, on resolving the industrial dispute. Meanwhile, Sunak has been warned that he faces a pre-election disaster if his high-profile childcare uh, expansion plan failed. The Prime Minister has had promised 15 hours a week of free childcare uh, for working parents, uh, with the scheme extending to all childcare from the age of nine months in September. Uh, And from 2025 September, working parents of uh, children under five uh, will be entitled to 30 hours free childcare per week, but with significant uh, nursery staff shortages and fears about funding. Um, Policy editor at The Observer says experts are predicting that many parents will be unable to access the scheme just weeks before they go to the polls. All that Plus, Elon Musk putting chips in your brain. 952-78-4000 is the phone number, studio at tre.radio. Also, if you want to talk about the Crown Prosecution Service, the 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 jury, the verdict this week to put the schizophrenic killer of three, uh, two young people and uh, an older gentleman, of course, in Nottingham, tragic story. There was an outcry as the defendant was sentenced to a secure hospital where he'll spend his life rather than a custodial sentence. People say things were missing. 952-78-4000. Alf, you're shaking your head. Yeah, the outcry wasn't about the sentencing. The outcry was because the Crown Prosecution Service had promised the people that he would be done for murder and he was done for manslaughter, which ch- changes completely their thing. They had the uh, the mother of the boy who was killed on, and she was absolutely excellent. Um, but it must be so hard gutting for them that they get promised one thing and then they deliver something. It's the Crown Prosecution Service again doing deals and whatever. It, it might humble view putting the guy into a hospital means he will, he will never see the light let's, let's see, it's, it's like it's not a hospital as no, in I mean no, it's no. secure no I've been I, I used to have to do funny enough I played badminton in a place that was that and walking we used to have to walk through the corridors and it was awful absolutely awful but you knew these people were never never going to come out and harm anybody ever again and, and the ones who were allowed near us they used to come and watch us playing badminton um, wasn't, one of the cra- my, wasn't one of the craze in a secure hospital for uh, Ronnie, Ronnie or Reggie was a, what, eventually, I eventually. Was it, was it Ronnie was put yeah. in for some mental disorder yeah. or something yeah, yeah but I mean to be honest you don't get a nickname like Mad, Mad Frankie Fraser Unless you're mad. <laughs> well, yes, indeed. Anyway. And, uh, and he, lived, he lived down the road from me in... Right. in <laughs> sorry, my Ben Right, then. Mad Frankie yes, Fraser. Indeed. He was part of the Cray gang. And I, I, I... Yes. I, yes. Let's, let's <laughs> and his son, his son stupidly went to Gibraltar for the day and the police nicked him and took him back for the rest of his sentence. 952-78-4000 <laughs> is the phone number. Right, so look, let's have a look at what we were saying about, if you want to talk, talk about um, uh, whatever you want to bring up on this morning's viewpoint. Um, looking at this, I mean, let's have a look at this. This the whole thing with the Sunak and the. Uh, there's two things with, with at the moment. The Tories, have, the Tories have got on this this on this election year on the run in, which we think will be November, pretty much so. It's got we've got the rail strikes and we've got this childcare plan. And the thing that struck me about this and, 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 don't, oh, and um, don't forget the yeah. council tax spending yeah. because that's going to be a major issue. The Tories are promising tax cuts, and at the same time, they're going to wipe out any tax cuts by local local authorities and. Their spending limits and, and that only last week another council went into effectively into bankruptcy and administration um, and, and that's going to carry on because local councils haven't been properly funded for probably uh, and I'm not going to blame just the Tories because it started under Labour and there was a there was an issue at the time with uh, with Brown and, and when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister and there was just because of the austerity sorry because of the crash of the money markets 
Labour started to have difficulties about local council funding. But the Tories have never, ever refitted it and they've taken more and more and more and more. They say they're taking responsibilities away from the local council, so therefore the money goes with the responsibility. But it's not true. So most of these local councils are now you know, bare bones. They're not like they used to be. They can't just do these things. And they, they still have these these legal things that are imposed on them, like childcare, like you know, lo- lots of stuff like that, mental health issues, running of care homes, all sorts of things that they have to do. But there's no there's no funding for it. So my view is this is just before an election. So they're going to say uh, you know, this is what people need to be aware of. Here's your tax cut, and by the way, you now got to pay more for your council tax. The, the second bit was what you were saying about the, the childcare. Yeah. It's called watch this space they've promised something that even when they did it remember they did this at the end of last year they've promised something that they knew couldn't be delivered yeah, before a general election it's the five o'clock press conference isn't it it's the we've got to say something that's going to sound and it and because well, of no because there, of, there's a genuine belief in doing this because it, it's what helps working people to survive uh, it, it, in, in futuristically, childcare is astronomical in the yeah. UK. Childcare costs, as as they are here, but what, what effectively they've done is they put it into knowing full well. Let's talk about September at the very earliest before they start introducing any form of scheme, and that's a, a minimalist bit. So if you if you assume that there's going to be a general election in anywhere from November onwards till whether they can go to February. Um, they're effectively, what they're doing is they're, they're now blackmailing the British people again by saying, if you vote for us, we'll give you your 15 hours of free childcare. What they're not saying today is, oh, look at what, you know, look at what we're going to do for you now in order for you to then get through it because they can't they can't possibly implement this mm. before a general election so it's, this is a general election problem i lift it up again here we Charles. go here we go manifesto, manifesto at a glance. glance okay they haven't delivered on anything from their last manifesto but we haven't, there, there, two things strike me one we don't again it's, it's staffing shortages and after after you've made the who you know who's who do you who do we think are going to be the people who mainly work in childcare and any sort of care? They're going to be people for, who aren't perhaps naturalised British, or they're they're coming from other from European nations or further afield. And therefore, after what we've what we've been through, what with this, that, and the other, um, it's you know it's again it's 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 you're not going to have the staff to do this. Yeah, but I disagree slightly that it would be uh, overseas people because. Most childcare in the UK comes from childcare organisations, and, and what they're employing are young people, young, young women in the main, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old women. Uh, and what they can't get from that is this is a, it's a bit like your comment about if you pay a sailor or a, a, someone in the army 18 grand a year, yeah. is that an incentive to come? Well, now you're going to pay somebody, remembering that 15 hours free childcare, they're going to have to do a, an almighty lot of work to to make childcare facilities full time yeah. and then pay people full time and and where and where is all this money coming from from the government they haven't once said and this is what we're going to use to fund it they've just said oh we'll give everybody 15 hours because what effectively what they're saying through the back door is and we expect because we're giving them uh generating work for them we expect the care home system to fund it so they're not even going to give these care homes you know for child care they're not even going to give them the money to set up they're expecting the industry to fund it does themselves. baroness moan have a child care thing do you Pardon? think do you think baroness moan's got a child care you know because <laughs> uh, that's what again we're going to go down to the we're going to go to, it's going to go to private private companies again isn't it that's what well, we're, most child care is private yeah, companies exactly, anyway exactly and it's just they're just and if they're not, and if they're not uh, private companies, they're private people who do it. Yeah, you know, my, my daughter had a, a childcare arrangement for for one of my grandsons when she was in England. Um, they couldn't afford it. What they've got here is is you know, Nan. 
they've had men for my seven grandchildren effectively yes, yes, the child, child, child minded children. yes but yes. it meant that you know she didn't work so and that's what a lot of people a lot of Spanish people it's, it's the, the boat the, uh, the owners is born by the, the grandparents absolutely it's, it's, it's always been the way Knife let's go let's you want to get involved with the show these are the numbers to contact TRE please call 952 78 4000 Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at tre Talk Radio. And good morning to Peter from Cartagena. Thank you for your message there. We'd love you to get involved with the show, though. 952-78-4000, the phone number, studio at tre.radio, is the email. I'm not, yeah, okay, fine. Um, I'm not, we, we're having a gang, a London gangs conversation as well. Trust me on this one. I've, no, honestly, Freddie, uh, just, just as an aside, Freddie Foreman most famously met my mum and she said, I, I have heard, he said to her, I've heard so much about you, which put the fear of God in <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, let's move on from that. Talk about the fear God, the French are... Go on. Walking, it's when they walk into the pub and you're playing around a pool with your mates. Yeah. And, and this guy with the, the nose that's all over his face that and one, cauliflower yeah. ears, like, walks up to you and says, do I know you? That's like, it's my turn on the pool table. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right, then, moving swiftly on, I was talking about things that are inevitable you don't want to meet in a dark alley. The French are at it again, aren't they? We've got, we've got this Operation Staff Paris. Have you any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, well... Yeah. It's the French again. The French, it's the French again. The, yeah, but they're really, they're really good at it. But this is, this is, this goes back to the why Thatcher and uh, people before her and after her couldn't cope with the common agricultural policy, because the French farmers just do the French government in, and you know if it ain't, because the next thing is they'll get the students involved, and I'm not sure, if, I'm not sure how many cobblestone roads they've still got left in Paris, but they get, they, they do a fair job of just digging them up. Quick call in morning call. You're live on TRV. What's your name? Where you're calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Morning, uh, um, Giles. Morning, Giles. It's come on. <laughs> morning, Giles. Um, <laughs> yes. As a Spanish. Yeah. Oh, I'm not telling you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, What's your show? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I was going to ask, ask a question as he's a granddad with kids in the system here. Mm. Um, guarderia uh, fees. When parents pay for the guarderia, I thought it was supposed to be affordable. Is it? Is it? I mean, there I are. Know. I mean, I know that some some because Benavides, for example, they, you get free because it, it's got La Zagaleta, which is the most expensive real estate in Spain. I think it's you get up to the age of five. I think it's free childcare yeah. because that's, that's a problem. So yeah, yeah. It, it can be subsidised. But anyway, but I, I was going to say unfortunate, but it's not unfortunate. My daughters are all teachers in 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 international colleges. So all my grandchildren go to school for free. So we do, we don't have any of that. Uh, that's no, I'm, like a, I'm on about I'm on about preschool, really. Yeah, yeah but preschool is is nan. Is no, what? No, no, nan. Yeah, my, but, my but wife has no, always about, looked after. Yeah, kids. I know, I know, yes. but I, I didn't know whether, whether you knew anything about the Guarderia there, system. There is, no, a, they get, they get, there is. It's oh. a family allowance, but it only goes up until the kids are three. Give me a call nine five two seventy eight four thousand because I'm flapping. Thank, thank you, Sharon. Thank you for that one. Indeed, just as a thing, I'm given the choice between me going into into childcare and joining the British Army. I think I know which one I, I'd take and be less frightening for <laughs> being involved. Yeah, I can see it now. Them lovely nappies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trust me on this one. Check the fam. Here we go. Check the familia numerosa process in Spain. Thank you very much for that one. Now, the reason talking about the, this whole thing, and thank you, Mark. It's the bloody French again. Thank you very much. Uh, or words to that effect. Um, because this raises questions about this is this whole e, e, the, the whole um, the, e, the French farmers German farmers Romanian farmers have been saying we're not happy with the European current policy the, the fear here is it's against this is Macron this is the French thing that the French do well I mean we know this air traffic control students farmers and also this uh, in the, at this time in France we're at a tipping point here with Macron because he's just put in this new president hasn't he this uh, this young guy so this is his first test it's Gabriel I think and I've, oh, his name escapes me but I'm sure that Stephen Ritson is even now typing to let me know got so. and uh, also this other thing is the fact that th this is this is could very well drive people towards Le Pen and um, and the the populists because people are saying that we're 
we are being underdone, it's not fair, we don't like this red tape. And if you start saying, oh, it's all red tape and it's all Europe, well, hey, there are, there are populist prime, there are populist candidates throughout Europe who will say, well, come to us, come get involved with us and we will get you out of this evil EU. Alf? When I was on with Jamie a couple of weeks back, um, and I said that there are 60 elections in the world this year, there's already been one, and my question at the time was, does anybody, do we think that everything's moving to the right? And France is yet another one, you know, Le Pen coming to the fore. It will always happen, but now we've got Farage and this, whatever they're called, is it respect? I have no respect for them, but whatever they're called, the Farage mob, 10% in the polls, you know, we're going to have an influence again. We're, we're back to pre-Brexit with Reform, with by the way. I reform, think whatever they're called. They're not, they're not reformers, Reboot. they're not nothing. They're just, they're just, no, right, right wing. Retread. <laughs> They're just right wing. That's the that's what the R stands for, right wing, and they and they care little for working class people, etc. The, 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 the he's like, the man on the street. Yeah, they're not well, on the street. Might, enough. Well, but, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, Hang on, I'll just take a Perhaps call. Perhaps he should be there. <laughs> Nine five six and eight four thousand. Morning, call you live on TRE. What's your name? Where you're calling from? What's your viewpoint, please? Good morning, guys. This is Margaret calling from Mr. Pony. Good morning, Margaret. How are you? Fine. Now, I have been watching the Spanish news, and on the Spanish news. They show videos taken by the lorry drivers on the French border. Yep. And they have been throwing all Spanish goods on the ground, burning their contents, emptying out wine from the cisterns, throwing the lorries over and damaging them. And they even showed some of the French farmers actually selling the products that they're taking from the Spanish lorries. Now, they don't say this on any other news. So, what do you think of that? Well, I think it's French doing what the French do best, aren't they? They're just disrupting and being... Yeah, pretty... but what about the poor Spanish uh, drivers? Uh, lorry drivers are losing their whole income and they can't even go through because a lot of the products are not going to France. They're going to other countries. Yeah, yeah this is this is the French disrupting the flow through France. This isn't... They're not because we're bringing... Yeah. Right, they're not French goods. They're it's Spanish goods going to anywhere else in Europe, but they have to go... You know, they've, they've got no option but to go through no, France. No, they have to go through France. And, and that's what we keep saying. The, the French workforce are well geared to this they know what they're doing so what that will do is it will, it will upset people like you but more importantly it then puts pressure from the Spanish government onto the French government you know that's what will happen because Spain would then say we need, we need freedom of movement of goods through France otherwise they've got to put everything and they're not going to do it are they there was a there was a comment yesterday I think about shipping some of it and when they mean shipping it's you know instead of you know, they'll <laughs> drive, drive it down to Malaga put it on a ship and, and sail it yeah. to Italy rather than putting it on a lorry and driving through yeah. France but it's just too expensive to do and yeah. it would it, it would kill Spanish uh, business so the exactly. pressure will come on to, to Macron to yeah. resolve this his resolution is to threaten the European Union and say to them unless we get a better deal then we've got this issue and of course the European Union have got no way of resolving this issue without affecting the whole of the common agricultural policy and the whole of the transport policy throughout the whole of Europe. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that might it, take them five or six years to yeah. resolve. And the French Prime Minister, the new one, came out and said that more or less the cause of the problems were the Spanish and the Italians. When there is a European Union common policy for mm. agriculture, so you cannot just go and blame two countries. Absolutely. Interesting. The, uh, the by the way, so thank you, Stephen. As, as I knew he'd be on. Uh, Gabriel Attal is the new is the new Prime Minister. Macron remains president. This is the yeah. new young guy. Mark, well, thank you, thank you very much for your call. It was good okay. to hear from you. Take Bye. care. Uh, the one, the other issue that you you mentioned that we haven't come back to, and, and again, it's another election thing. I, I believe is the. Uh, 
I'm going to sort out the unions over the rail strikes. Oh, yeah, here we go. It's, it's not about sorting out the unions over the rail strikes. He's just getting big-headed about what he thinks he can do to, to in this case, the rail unions because they're the ones on strike. What's he going to do about the consultants? What's he, what's he still going to do about junior doctors? What's he still going to do about people oh, doctors, working no, in doctors, the... I, I refer to them as doctors in training. Doctors in training. <laughs> do you remember that one? <laughs> yeah. I mean, of all the bleeding things to say, you know. That, that guy's still on telly now, and he, he, he Madame Blanc, rather. Yeah, but, you know, but it's also it's called just because the, just because the NHS workers arrived at a settlement doesn't mean they're happy. Just because the, the teachers have arrived at a settlement doesn't mean they're happy. Just because it, and it goes on and on and on, and then the next round will come, and and I, because technically inflation is is. Uh, in in a decrease, and because and people might feel better, but in reality, what happens is it's it's not a most union people that I know. I mean, union members, not right. union organisers. I was a you know, I was very proud of the fact I was a union leader. I, I led people through this stuff. But one of the things you learn very quickly is that most union members are very pragmatic. If they can't afford to put chocolate on the table for their kids... Chocolate? Then, yeah, well, that's right. That's the luxury, I, I isn't it? I was going to say, I don't know what your union so, is. You know, if they can't get foie gras by Friday... Well... It is that simple thing, you know, the kids want to have a Kit Kat and you can't afford to give them a Kit Kat. I'll tell you who they talk to. They don't go and talk to the government. They go and talk to the union leaders and mm. say, oh, you've got to sort this out. So the pragmatism of the health workers, the pragmatism of the, you know, all of the others, junior doctors or doctor in the house or <laughs> whatever he I was mean, called. doctor in training. <laughs> on it's, it's, it's immense. And what they're trying to do is say, well, there's a general election coming. If you want us to sort these these you know, these union leaders, um, you you vote for us, put them in, and we'll give them a really bloody nose. They've they've spent two years, two years not talking to the rail unions. They've got umpteen different rail companies they have to deal with and the and the union go well we'll deal with all the rail companies but every time we go to deal with the rail companies the government comes along and says to the rail companies you can't do that so we'll go to the government oh no we're not in control the government ain't in control you have to talk to the rail companies okay so we go back to the rail companies and the rail companies say oh well, the government have told us we can't and then and then because it was getting a bit iffy the rail companies stopped saying the government won't let us do that they've come up with some other excuse but effectively if you've if you've been around the scene for any time as soon as you start talking about changing work arrangements mm. not pay levels work arrangements as soon as you say that you can only deal with the rail company and if the rail company wants to arrive at an agreement with the unions that suits them because they're going to get their their railways back working again and the government comes along and says oh no 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 you know, you know you've got to have a private company for cleaning or you've got to have a, you know, something for maintenance or you've got to have this different rail network. As soon as the government say one thing, it means the government have an influence. Um, and unfortunately, well, Sunak can say what he likes. He's, I'd love to see him, actually, in a room full of trade union leaders well, it's just different. trying to negotiate his way out of but it. But it's kind of, that's two different styles of politics because Sunak's a technocrat. Sunak likes, likes fuddling with the figures. Yeah. You, know, the, yeah, he, you know, you can see him in Germany having a great time saying, well, inflation's coming down. That's, that's not going to win him an election. He needs a statement. He needs to say to something like, I'm, he needs to, to channel his inner, inner Margaret and yeah, say, yeah, I'm yeah. taking it like, he, you know, like, I know, and he's, he's, you know, he'd love a little war going on. If he thinks that the rail unions are like the miners walk, walking into the trap, then he's totally wrong because the, the rail workers, and the one thing the rail workers have done, I don't agree with them, by the way, the, the, the main leader of the rail workers pretends that he's not political. He's more left-wing than, than my left arm. Um, but they've done this very clever That's thing of saying... That's slower than half. Well, yeah, but they've, well, they've done this very clever thing of saying this isn't about politics. They've actually removed the union from a... They're not going there saying we want a Labour government to sort this out. That's further from what they've said. What they've said is we don't give, we don't give a damn what the government is, what colour it is, what flavour it is. This is what we want sorted out. 
um, whoever it is in power. So if, if Starmer wins, the first thing he's got to do is sort out the rail companies. It's, it's, it's a simple, basic uh, premise that you come from, which removes, technically, politics from a... You know, a, a government union war. But you see, the, the thing is that, you know, Sunak wants to make this a political... In the Absolutely. same way, I mean, a culture war against He the wants to make it political because, because he thought, needs it. Exactly. But the unions are saying, we're not being political. We just, you just leave us alone to deal with the rail companies and we'll find a solution for each rail company. What we're not going to be able to do is for you to keep poking your nose in and stopping the rail companies arriving at agreements with us. So, so Sunak has got this political dilemma. He wants to turn it into... So now it's called, oh, they, they don't even care about what's happening. They're not going to talk. It's like, yeah, we are talking. They, t- they talk to the rail operators probably every week. I would guess there's some committee of some sort that have to talk to the rail company. It'll be as a collective. It won't be 14 different companies or however many there are. But they will talk to them as a collective... Almost every week there will be issues that the rail companies need the unions to to look at, to deal with. Even things like leaves on the line, you know, flooding. Whatever it is, you need your workers to get your system going. But when it comes to the issues about hours of duty, night working, shift patterns, all that, the government should stay well away, but they won't because they are trying to dictate to the rail Companies, no, this is how we want you to deal with it because it will then knock on to all the all the other industry people. Mm. Uh, also, you know, if if the rail workers get a decent pay rise and don't have their hours and conditions changed, then the, the next lot of people in line will be saying exactly the same. We did it for the rail workers. Now you got to do it for us. So, what, but the, the promise with 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 the rail unions, you know, going on strike, it mucks up the commuters. You know, Britain is is highly dependent on its rail network for everything. You only have to be in. You know, we've been in London when. You know, there's knights trying to get out of Victoria Station or Waterloo because the lines are down. No, I lived in London. I never tried to escape. Well, I would know. You see, <laughs> yeah, but when I was living in St. Reatham, for example, <laughs> otherwise known as Streatham. Streatham. Uh, yeah, things went, oh, well. things went bad. I had to go from Clapham Common North to down even, to Streatham. Even when the trains were running properly, it was difficult yes, to get right, to Streatham. But, you know, you, it, was too, it was too far to walk. So you'd be sat yep. there on the bike. So you were sat there on the Absolutely. platform, you know, down at Victoria trying to get a train out. And it's just, it's just mayhem. Or even the night bus. Yeah, oh, just don't go there. Yeah, in- incredible but, stuff. But, okay, but, well, if you're trying to get up from Brighton, for example, you know, going from Brighton, three, you know, three bridges, Haywards Heath. I, I went back to... Uh, my, my grandson's just started at university in, in Worcester, and we went back to see him. And we were concerned then that we wouldn't be able to get a train to get from Bristol Airport to Worcester. So we end up hiring a car just in, in order to avoid that. Yeah. My grandson then flies home because it was the end of Christmas. So he, he flies back and the trains were all over the show. So he, he missed his tr- he missed one train and he got to the next one. But this is on a line where the trains are still running. If he'd have been going, instead of going to Worcester, if he'd have been going to the, the next place over um, to the right that is the middle of the country well, well Chip, done Cheltenham I think yeah, it's Cheltenham possibly wouldn't have got a train right because there weren't no trains and you just go that's the state of affair the, the whole lot's got into and then, and then you have to sometimes you have to listen to the unions and believe them because they'll say even if the service was untouched by industrial action you still can't get a train I just realised I've got to get two breaks in before we get to the end of the we've got, we've got 23 minutes to go. We're having such a good time this morning on Viewpoint, so I'm going to do this now. Viewpoint with Giles Brown. Always live, always lively. Into the last 20 minutes of today's Viewpoint, we've been rattling along. I'm here with Alf Proof. We're going to get involved with today's show. To contact TRE, please call 952 78 4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. Yes, in on the WhatsApp from Mark. Renationalise the trains and pay NHS staff real money. I'm with Alf. There you go. Vote Alf. Vote, vote Brewery. You know, it makes sense. Right. Yeah. Right. I had that 40 years ago. Perhaps yeah. I should have stood for exactly. an election. Exactly. But I never did. But then again, you see, politics as loss is, is talk radio Europe's gain, Alf. <laughs> <laughs> right then. Yes, uh, I agree. Should the, the railways should have been renationalised 
about five years ago when the Tories first started getting into real trouble with the train operators and the only thing that really stopped it because they had all the complaints if you remember was that the it was people like Branson and yeah, running, was, running their private train companies were saying well give us a bit more time and, and we'll make things right and to be honest they've just made things worse it's sexy, it's sexy and glamorous yeah, uh, that's yeah, the whole yeah. thing you get Branson involved but you know I said the mail's calling it a the union's com- campaign of contempt it's really interesting how they spin it you know it's like oh well the, the unions aren't for you people and Rishi's going to stand up and, and, and that, uh, they're, they're making it that wall aren't they I don't, I don't ever recall the unions ever treating any government with contempt because the one the first well, the people he's saying, he's, he's saying that the, 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 so they're trying to spin it to say that the, the, the Daily Mail this morning makes it out as if you know, yesterday the data Telegraph said, "How does evolve world? How will World War Three affect us? Yeah, yeah. Turnips for everybody." Uh, and uh, today, Rishi, they're saying Rishi, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a campaign by the unions against against the passengers, and Rishi's trying to sort it out. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's whatever what a time is, to be alive. The, there's two things you learn pretty quickly as a, as a union official because yes, you can be bolshy, yes, you can be left wing, yes, you can have ideals, you can have all of that ideology, idioms, whatever. You, you can have all of that, but at the end of the day, you have members, and at the end of the day, it's the members who decide. You know, if a member doesn't walk out, you ain't got a strike. So this point is, you know, issuing threats to people if you can't deliver the members, and you're not delivering the members, you're just putting the argument as to what could happen should the members decide to do something. So what, what you're seeing with all of this is, yeah, I was, I was being serious. The TUC, as the voice piece for the unions collectively, have, have always, always had conversations with people in government. And I don't mean, I don't mean the, the prime minister or the ministers, but all of those, you know, what we call the diplomats, all of those departments, you know, so if, you, if you're in farming, you know, the National Union of, of Farm Workers will go and talk to the, to the Minister for Agriculture. You won't, they won't talk to the minister. They'll go and talk to the civil servants. Mm-hmm. You've got a problem in the health service. You don't go and talk to the Secretary for Health. You go and talk to the, ch- the Chief Executive or whatever. Or you'll go to individual trusts and talk to them. Yeah, you know, and, and in the days when they had regional people, you'd go and talk to the regional people. You, you talk to the people who are going to make things happen. You don't talk to the people who are, I need to get elected people. So the unions, in my honest, humble opinion, have always been keen to have relations with the people that make the decisions that make it happen where they where they all where it always goes wrong always goes wrong is when the government get involved in a in a union issue directly so for instance when i worked for bt and we decided to go on strike over pay why why the hell were the, the tory well yeah why was john major involved in any conversations that we were having, why was the, why was the chief executive of BC telling us what the government were thinking? We didn't care. We just wanted a pay rise, mm. and we were dealing with the employer. As soon as the government get involved, you know there's an ulterior. Like with the miners, yeah. everybody knew. I, I, Arthur Scargill was right in one respect about look at what they're going to do. He was just wrong, in my opinion, about what he, he should have done a lot more for the miners about compensation and things like that. But the writing was on the wall. Thatcher was going to close the coal mines, no matter what. That was that was the total thing. Why did why did she want to close the coal mines? Well, because you could buy cheaper coal from Europe. You could buy bauxite, which was a big thing from from Germany. You couldn't even mine bauxite in the UK, so you had to buy it from Germany. And bauxite was was the then uh, stuff that they used in power stations right. for, for power stuff. So you had this, and, uh, and they built it up to this issue. And what you had is Thatcher saying, we're going to deal with the unions, and the unions going, oh, we'll see about that. And, and unfortunately, some of the union, not all of them remember, some of the union leaders was like, well, we might as well take them on because we think we can give the government a bloody nose. Mm. And they weren't strong enough. Nine five two seventy eight four thousand. Morning, call you live on TRE. What's your name, where you're calling from, what's your viewpoint, please? Hello, Giles. It's Jason. How are we doing? Good morning to you, Jason. Good to have you with us. 
Yeah, likewise. Um, so if they do uh, nationalise the railways again, of course, it won't make any difference because the line share of everything will get spent down the south. Look at all that absolute nonsense, uh, promising to level up the north with the south. And then they built this HS2. They made sure they built the southern end first before they ran out of money. I think the danger is now there is a really distinctive divide uh, in the north um, in terms of poverty, in terms of the, 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 the culture of the north feeling increasingly disenfranchised, increasingly disillusioned with politicians, um, sick to the back teeth that the country is run from down south, the money spent down south, and it's not an even playing field. And all these lies that come out of politicians' mouths promising to uh, even things up, it's nonsense. And I think this will manifest itself this time in the election. I think there will be uh, significant losses in the North to Conservatives because people are just sick to the well, people are sick to death of politicians in general because of the tragedy that comes out of the mouth, but more, more so in the North. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much for that. Jason sounds like a, 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 a political broadcast on, on, on behalf of the Plantagenets, but good to have you with us. The, and the complication, Jason, to be honest, about the, the people in North, uh, you, the, the Tories are going to suffer in the North, and you go, fine, but... Is it going to be replaced by non-participation or is it going to be replaced by people positively saying we don't like what your government's doing, we want a different government? Because there's nothing worse, in, in my honest, honest opinion, there's nothing worse than a pile of people deciding to opt out of the system or, or vote for a party that's you know, not, not going to win power and they opt out, and, and effectively, you leave a vacuum that is then filled by what is effectively second best. And, and that's not what happened in 97. It's not what happened even, even you know, I went back and worked in 2010 when Golden Brown lost. Even then, it wasn't about we're fed up with the politicians and this, that and the other. It was be because the financial situation in the world drove something and there was, a, there was a genuine belief that it could be changed. And if you recall, it wasn't changed by people not voting Labour and voting Tory. It was changed by people not voting Labour and voting Lib Dem because it created that... That then and, and and then what you saw was the absolute epitome of do they lie? And I always defend them. They don't lie. They just don't know how to tell the truth properly. And, and, the, and the, Lib, the Lib Dems were very very poor at it because they promised no student fees. Yeah. And the first thing they gave up on in a cabinet meeting, not even going to the people, not even campaigning about it, the first thing they did was went to a cabinet meeting and sold out on that issue and allowed the Tories to increase student fees. And, and that's when you go, what is the point of voting for all these people? So it, you can't even say it was, you know, Labour going to Tory. It, it was a little bit of that. But it was, it, and then after that, of course, the Lib Dems just collapse in a heap because nobody believes them or trusts them anymore. And you end up with it being poor Labour because they, they never really survived the 2010 general election versus versus a buoyant Cameron who was going to give everybody Brexit. Like, no, they were going to give them a vote on whether they left Europe. It wasn't called Brexit at the time. And Cameron Cameron won it easily. And, and I'm, you never, ever forget what he said. Whatever the outcome of the, of the vote, I will still be here to see it through. Oh, yeah. Two days later, he resigned because he didn't win what he thought he was expecting. Was it two days later? It was, the it was the afternoon. I was, I was doing it to Good Morning Britain with Kate, with Kate with, uh, Garraway that oh, morning. And there you go. So and then Trump, Trump arrived. It was because Trump was flying in. Right. You know, and we, we, were doing, we were doing an outside well, for broadcast. For a round of golf. For a round of golf. <laughs> for a round of golf. And we had to interrupt Trump, and that was happening. And the next thing we knew, David Cameron came out. Cameron and, came and, that, out and, and said, said yes. goodbye. 
He never even said I've had enough. He, he never even said I lost. Right. He just said I, I don't have the I don't have the people behind me. Absolutely correct. Didn't have the people going into it. So. Right then. Let's look at some of the WhatsApps coming in. Morning to Dirk. Good morning. All, all, good morning all. In the seventies, the Labour government in the Netherlands closed all the pits in the south of the country whilst re- investing heavily in reschooling, infrastructure, and compensation. It all went pretty smoothly. I lived in London during the miners' strike, and it made me wonder what on earth they were doing. Well, p- part of the other, well, f- forgetting the, the miners' union and what went on with them, one of the one of the biggest issues that was never explained and never dealt with properly was what what do you do about do, do these people? These places aren't specific. You could go to any mining town. You was just mining. And you could and it's just mining. Yeah. There was nothing else. There's no car manufacturing, yeah. no nothing. It's just mining. So when the mine closes, what do you do with ten thousand people? So what the argument was, and, and the union at the time, not the National Union of Miners, but one of the other unions, changed its name to the Community Union. Mm. And they they were heavily into getting the government to invest in community issues. So gyms, uh, st- stuff for the kids, yeah, so was, all, yeah. that, all, the, all of the community. So, so if you go to a lot of the ex-mining places, yeah, there's a lot of run-down stuff and a lot of people left, you know, to, to go into where there was still industry left. But what is, what is left is they have some tremendous community stuff going on in these places. Very, very, yeah. Until the Tories came back in power and started taking money away from local councils, local communities, and then you see another rundown. So you've now got mining towns that went through all of the so you know semi recovery from a, their mine closing um, into oh we've got it all again. There's a place I, I worked in. Um, it's called Sedgley and Gornal. Two, two towns, two mining towns, but there was only one mine. And the mine was in, in the middle, right. down the valley. And every Saturday night, the guys would go to their respective working man's clubs, pubs and whatever. And at you know, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, whatever tipping time they come out, they'd walk, they'd march down the, to the bottom and have a punch up yeah, well, that was that that's was their, that's, lo- that's local community at its best that was you know, that was right. their entertainment but what happened then is because the mine closed they lost all of that and what you then saw was lots of petty crimes all over the show yeah my uh, a very good friend a friend of mine I, well, a guy i met in london a scottish guy named jockey strangely enough yeah, uh, he famous he famously said that when the miners got compensation because he was a miner so they got for a ten, this is 30 years ago for they got ten thousand pounds compensation yeah. said everybody went and bought themselves new tvs yeah six months later everybody's breaking into each other's houses to get the tvs, get the TVs yeah. i'm gonna go to a short break and then we're going back to the last five minutes of this morning's viewpoint Viewpoint on Talk Radio Europe with Giles Brown. And we're back. Last five minutes, as always, so if you want to get your calls in... To contact TRE, please call 952-78-4000. Email studio at tre.radio. Send us a WhatsApp on plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five. Message us on Facebook, Talk Radio Europe Official, or tweet us at TRE Talk Radio. Uh, this in from Mark again. Although I've reversed my Brexit thoughts, Cameron was a person, not the exact word, for bailing out and leaving two or more unelected PMs in power. And now he's a lord with a cabinet position. I feel like doing a, a Jonathan Pyle style rant. You know, those things. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. Well, Mark, uh, good to have you with us. Uh, we're into the last, blimey, three and a half minutes of this morning's viewpoint. We haven't even touched on what's happening in Northern Ireland. It's been breaking, uh, which is the DUP saying they're going to go back and diva you know go back to stormont which they said they weren't going to do which is which is interesting interesting news indeed especially as they've um, set it up and the first thing they do is have a go at the Tories and say it's because of the Tories we've got to protect our borders but you can't do this to Northern Ireland I thought that was quite fascinating but at least the DUP have said they're well, going yeah, to they're they're select people for Stormont so at least they'll get some local government back in Northern Ireland the, so Jeffrey Donaldson, who's the leader of DUP, yeah, yeah, yeah. says he um, his party will restore power sharing in Northern Ireland, subject to the UK government tabling and passing new legislative measures as agreed in negotiations. 
says the deal would safeguard Northern Ireland's place within the UK and crucially from the DUP's point of view would remove checks on goods moving within the UK and remaining in Northern Ireland so uh, we will see does that mean we can get English sausages back over here um, so via Southern Ireland right, something yes <laughs> now, I, I can see a lucrative I can see a lucrative link staying there just looking at some other bits and pieces we haven't even there was so much to, it's, been, it's been a busy news week uh, as as she as we said good morning as well to people listening good morning to Alexander and good morning to Shanine and Adrian and Lindsay enjoy all listening and good to have you with us uh, thanks for signalling that you, you are out there 95278 is the phone number if you want to get your uh, your last thoughts of the day in um well okay fine okay well thank you gary for that um 95278 is the phone number um yes right then right well i'm almost out of time uh, alf uh your final thoughts please final thoughts are i am really looking forward to about 10 months of election Stuff coming out from the Tories. It's going to be well, fascinating. About putting, stuff. It, putting his the thing about putting his wife on the on the hustings. The other day. Absolutely. Well, what's that? I mean, that's that's this. That's not when they were trying to. They got into her to introduce him at the <laughs> Conservative Party conference in that sort of Michelle Obama to Barack Obama style, which sort of backfired big time. Uh, uh, and, just, and how's she going to? How's she going to appropriate? How's she going to? I just feel know, sorry for the people. Uh, who go, I hate politics. I just feel sorry for the people, full stop. <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, I hate politics, and you're just going to, every day that you turn the television on, there will be another trick, as I call it, a, a political trick of one description or another, oh. which is only aimed at electioneering, and it's a shame that they can't say, the election starts now, now start totting up how much money you've spent. Look on the bright side, we could always be at war with Russia, so, I mean, that might not be. <laughs> that might, that might, because that's how we kicked You're off today. A, you are such a happy chap. I haven't been happy since Nixon resigned, but what I'm saying is that basically... <laughs> Watch know. this space, anything well, can happen. Anything. Or it could be Iran at exactly. worst still, or... Or indeed, you, you know... You never know. You let's, never know. It's just, no, let's not even think it. <laughs> I'm, keep, I'm keeping my eyes on, on Dagnamese, to be honest and with you. And of course, what will, what will happen as well is, what will sidetrack a lot of the election stuff in the UK will be the Trump saga. Well, yeah, yeah, that's Trump not- and Biden. I mean, and everybody says it, and you just you do wonder why the hell can't two massive, big political organisations find people who are younger? Uh, it's just more vibrant. Talking about younger and more vibrant. Yeah, I'm too old for well, this. Exactly. <laughs> more left wing than my left arm is my, my saying. <laughs> uh, thanks for your calls in. Uh, thanks for the while. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I will be back tomorrow. This show will be repeated at 7. Stephen Ritson is up next. Views expressed on Viewpoint by invited studio guests and callers do not constitute an opinion endorsed in any way by Talk Radio Europe. You've been listening to a TRE production. If you've enjoyed this program, there'll be another episode waiting for you next week, right here on this platform, where you can also access our extensive back catalogue of shows and interviews. For more information on our live programming, social media channels and apps, and how to contact Talk Radio Europe, please visit tre.radio.